Queen's are in the group house, present in the Indian and civil service in Bihar capital. Rangi is still her, Kalidhan is still her. Uh, her relation with India is more than three decades long. Though she started her research career in India way back in 1969 on the revolution in Punjab, her protracted field work in Tamil Nadu and Bengal has given her dual honorary subnational identity of being both Tamilian and Bengal. When I visited a few weeks back, the family of late students and Gupta in Sassanikitan, a close associate of Homer Sen, they referred about Barbara almost as a member of their family. Her involvement with the geographical location of her work is so intense that she also becomes a cultural part of that area. I am sure there will be more places in this group. People will be given to her cultural nationality. Apart from India, she has done research in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Franco and Sahel of West Africa. But her principal work has long has been long term agrarian change, the role of the market, issues of social welfare, and more recently, the character of Indian capitalism. She has published many research articles and books. Her recent book on outcasts from social welfare, adult disability, and incapacity in rural South India, globalization and insecurity, and India's working cases on economy and society. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justice Ravi and Bhavan, the President of this gathering, also needs no introduction to the Patna intelligence. During his tenure as the Chief Justice of the Patna High Court, he has created an indelible imprint, not only in the legal fraternity, but also in the world of scholarship. He, as many of us know, comes from an illustrious family of Elaba. His father, Justice Sankishwaru Dhawan, besides being a legal woman, was also Governor of West Bengal and later High Commissioner of India in the United Kingdom. His brother, Mr. Rajiv Dhawan, became an outstanding lawyer, now a senior advocate to the Supreme Court. Both of them were President of the Cambridge Union, a rare instance of son calling the right to stay with his father. Mr. Justice Dhawan, after graduating from the Yaga University, law was called the bar in 1965 and later became a judge there in 1986. In January 2000, he had joined the Patna Echo as his chief justice. His career records clearly indicate that he derived particular pleasure from doing the cases of both who would otherwise not have had the access to legal system. While judging labor dispute, he became a co-runner in rethinking management workers' relations. He also did a lot of work on matters related to urban planning and environment. In the state to which he belongs, the people call him Green Judge. And after elevation to the bench, he has written copiously about preserving public parks, selling rivers, streams of pollution, and restoring the ecological balance in Kumaon and Garwal region. In this respect, Professor Harris White and Mr. Justin Thurman are indeed fellow travelers, both deeply committed to the issues of sustainable development. We have first hand knowledge that when Justin Thurman joined the Chief Justice, he took up matters to restore grassroots democracy, which he had been missing from the state uh, for almost 25 years. He ensured that elections are held to the panchayat and municipalities and it is because of his order that Panchayat and Municipalities became functional again. In Bihar, he has also shown concern on human rights. <coughs> the teasing of women and girls at the public spaces saw no different issue and the state government was at a loss to defend failure to grant security to women. Mr. Justice has also expressed concern on illegal occupation of public places. <coughs> For instance, Gandhi Maidan saw an order from his bench ensuring that the state police got occupation of Gandhi Maidan Park restored to the people. <coughs> this is the first court that has shown interest in preserving ecological balance in the river in Bihar and special concern has been expressed by entire state to state 
fresh water fossils the ganges and it becomes a sanctuary for expansion or industry trying to set up industry this judgment on various issues are stimulating for academic thought i can say without any hesitation for getting any concrete insight into many aspects of Bihar society and economy, the various legal pronouncements will be a must reading for all serious academic researchers. <laughs> if not for anything else, he will be remembered for Bihar for decentralization of the policy by ensuring Panchayat election of the most important debates. I can recount several instances where he had acted as a bridge between the civil society and the alternate state structure. At RG, we welcome, in, we welcome interacting with him, and it is our belief he will join us in our academic efforts. We sincerely felt that in this momentous occasion of our this foundation lecture, that Professor Harris White, we couldn't have invited anybody else other than Mr. Justice Havan to preside over the meeting. I also take this opportunity especially welcome you. In the Indian a full right scholar, a freelance uh, writer in her own right. I'm sure uh, this year also, our Foundation foundation lecture will act as a great benefit for idealism and ideology to this increasingly intellectually dedicated city of Patna. With this word, I once again welcome you all to the ninth RP Foundation. Thank you. I invite uh, Mr. Justice Thurman to speak. tries to offer research in a demystified form and to put culture 
and to put cultural change central in its research. So I felt that it would be appropriate to discuss with you an issue which many people put under the big rubric of culture. For me to discuss religious plurality, it's a partial attempt to answer a larger question. And the larger question is the nature of order in India's informal economy. That is the larger part of the Indian economy which is outside the reach of the state. Activities which are unregistered, not taxed, where labor has no enforceable rights either at work or to social security. It won't surprise you to know that this is the larger part of the Indian economy. It supplies livelihoods to 93% of the population. It accounts for 60% of net domestic product. So my larger project within which this lecture fits is to inquire into the nature of social authority in the Indian informal economy. How does this economy achieve order? How do forms of authority which arise outside the economy achieve order inside the economy? I've been looking at this in relation to the accumulation of productive capital, productive wealth. So my inquiry has necessarily been in small towns, in the India what I call the India of the 88%, because even now, 88% of the Indian population lives in towns and villages smaller than two lakhs in size. So I want to take you on something of an adventure this evening. I want to explore the role of religious plurality in the economy. Now at the outset, we face a lot of problems. India is a religiously plural society. There is an enormous Hindu family in which there are all kinds of sects within Hinduism itself, plus the three large family members, um, Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism. And then, very long established in India, are also a number of, of other religions, Christianity, Islam, the Parsi faith, whose origins lie outside India's territory. On top of that, we have the religious beliefs of tribal people and of scheduled castes. And there is a huge debate in the literature on the extent to which their beliefs are, could be considered to be separate from Brahman Hinduism. There's an enormous amount of controversy there. So we have a tremendously heterogeneous um, set of religions. And we have a paucity of understanding and a paucity of theoretical ideas and predictions about the role of these religions, of religious plurality in an economy. And there was practically no research while religions are lived day by day by everybody, including everybody in this room. And at first, when I set out on this adventure, I wondered whether the fact that they were ignored meant that they were unimportant. I can't actually tell the contribution of the religious minorities to India's GDP it hasn't been studied. If religious plurality is not unimportant, then why has it been neglected? I started out with these questions. The relationship between religions in the plural and an economy in the singular has never been theorized. I don't actually think it can be discussed in the abstract either. When we talk about religion, we also have to distinguish religious ideas, doctrines, revelation, and conduct, which of course embraces a much wider span of human experience than the economy. We have to distinguish that from religions as social organizations, as markers of identity, which have been given sacred status by their beliefs and values. And in my talk, although they're I shall, focus, I shall focus on the second aspect of religion, religion as social organization, because I'm certainly not qualified to talk about the first. Mm -hmm. I know there's enough to say um, about religion as social organization. I'll start by talking about 
ideas about Hinduism and India's development. And I do this even though I'm going on to talk about the minorities. Because India's hegemonic religion has shaped social and legal institutions which affect the other religions and through them affect the economy. Bruno Mirdal, the Swedish development economist, is representative of um, the insights of development economics. In his massive work called Asian Drama, he drew from Dvahar Nehru the idea that religion in general and Hinduism in particular was, and I quote, a tremendous force for social inertia. Nehru, Mirza, and many of the founding fathers of modern Indian sociology took inspiration from Weber's ideas that the foundations of modern capitalism lay in Protestantism, and they then used this to explore the way in which the ideas of Hinduism might lead to a lack of capitalism, in other words, to India's economic backwardness as they saw it. Now, in the Islam, this argument is so incompletely developed that you might say it's assertive. Reading between the lines, it seems that Nirdal is arguing that um, the tolerance of inequality, the notions of relative purity, and the hierarchies of inclusion and exclusion associated with Hinduism meant that stratification is tolerated, and that this kind of stratification would set limits to free competition and to economic mobility. Nirdal concluded that all this needed reform. By the time Nirdal wrote his book in 1968, the idea that Hinduism was responsible for India's economic backwardness had already been in question. An American anthropologist called Milton Singer had interviewed India's industrial leaders and found that they borrowed selectively from both Western industrial culture and from Hinduism. And that because of this, it was Hinduism rather than secularity that formed the cultural basis for capitalist modernity in India. It followed that Hinduism was a force for change and not for inertia, and also that it didn't need reform. But the way reform had already been conceived was to have deep implications for Indian development. Religion was to be pushed back into what is called the private sphere. The prime movers of this force pushing religion back relegating it to the private sphere, were to be business, the state, and planned development. I quote from Nehru, the real thing is the economic factor. If we may stress on this and divert public attention to it, we shall find automatically that religious differences recede into the background, and a common bond unites different groups. Here, Nehru betrays a debt to Marx. And everyone knows that for Marx, religion was the heart of a heartless world. He called it the opium of the masses, what we might now know as an analgesic. And as an opium of the masses, it was useful to the bourgeois interest. Marx expected working people to see the role of religion in masking the tribulations, called the alienation, of labor, and to reject these conditions that required the comfort of religion to emancipate themselves and thereby to relegate religion to private life. Well, everyone here knows that this has not happened. No economist, to my knowledge, has been, has been studying the material conditions that make religion indispensable and that is, are reproducing religious plurality rather than relegating it to private life. Meanwhile, religions attack one another while Murdoch's comment is as relevant as it ever was that no one is attacking religion. I saw four reasons why. One of the reasons I think lies in the state's concept of secularism. In India, it is a concept meaning equal public respect for all religions. And there's never been an active encouragement of state promotion for a public culture which, which is opposed to or skeptical of religion, which is another definition of secularism. Perhaps this is because at the start of the uh, development project after independence, Nehru, as I've indicated, thought that economic development would do that job. Whatever has happened, um, almost the opposite, 
um, have occurred in India from what Nehru expected to, to happen. And this policy of secularism, equal public respect for all religions, has moved from equal respect to toleration, under which inequality between religions is accepted, and Hinduism becomes a religion which is national and, as it were, secular, and moves onwards, as we all know, to more or less xenophobic political movements for Indian nationhood to be based on the Hindu religion, which, as I said, is the precise opposite of the original apparent intention. Now, two propositions in the late writings of Max Weber help us to make sense of this paradoxical outcome when they're applied to India. Weber, like Marx, was concerned with establishing foundations for successful capitalism. As all this audience know, they converge on private property, free labor, um, rational accounting systems, a weakening of the irrational restrictions on economic activity, and rational regulative law and the public administration uh, for it. Now, in India, there is an extensive body of universalistic regulative law, which is rationalist in spirit and well-reasoned. The problem is that in implementation and in enforcement, it is far from universalistic, and its rationale is contested. Equality of citizenship is also contested, especially by property high caste men. Regulation on the ground is shaped by local interests. There is study after study to show how this works and how mainly the local interests which predominate are those of the patriarchal intermediate classes and their caste come corporatist forms of regulation. Then in India, there's a large body of family or personal or customary law which is not usually thought to have any bearing on the economy. This law is organized along religious lines and has divine authority and divine origin. But it's due to this law that resources are organized in firms and that the inheritance of these resources and alliances and partition of these resources are organized. In other words, the terms of participation in the economy of the business family are actually regulated under divine law. The existence of this law, if I'm right, violates the very principle of the state's mutual distance between the religions, between the private sphere and the public sphere. So, even though there is a rational, uh, universalistic body of law in India, to the extent that I've described, this law is flawed in its practice. The second argument of Weber, which is relevant to this problem, it has been argued that under certain circumstances, a big religion may be a solvent to the obstacles of development posed by many smaller religions. Now, Hinduism is a big religion by any account, so we must look into this in, in more detail. Weber did not say that a big religion is necessary or sufficient as a solvent, just as it may be under certain circumstances. It may be necessary in order to break down barriers to citizenship, and the implication is that it's temporary. But it's certainly insufficient because a big religion may still hinder the rational spirit of capitalism. So one general reason why religion persists in the public domain is in my view that the state's approach to secularism and the state's approach to the regulation of the economy, instead of desacralizing the economy, impairs its capacity to do precisely this. The economy is then a territory for religious competition, if only because religions are one of the informal bases for the distribution of rents. So it's not only that religions persist in India for all kinds of reasons which are outside the economy. It's also that the economic and political superstructures now make religion indispensable and, as a result, the production conditions then reproduce religion. Now, in the bulk of my paper, I look at the roles I ask, I, I ask the question which the meager literature enables me 
to find some answers to. And that is a very simple question. What is the role of the religious minorities in the Indian economy? And the long central part of my paper is a description of what I found. Now, if I talk to this, I think I will take a very long time to give this lecture, far too long. Everyone will fall asleep. What I want to do is to take themes from that central part of my, my discussion. And no doubt, in the questions and the comments and the discussion after my lecture, some of the details will need to be brought out. So I'm afraid that what I have to say in the next section of my talk is going to be um, compressed and in capsule form. What are the themes which are brought out by a discussion, by another uh, an analysis of the position of religious minorities in the Indian economy? I want to look at Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, and Jains. Muslims, as we know, are about 13% of the population. They're disproportionately urban. They are highly differentiated uh, in terms of where they are in the economy, and they're very dispersed in the Indian economy. Now, there are some people who say that Muslims are threatened and, and thre uh, threatened the majority religion and are indulged by the majority religion. But my research shows that by and large, um, they are economically more backward than um, the majority religion in the Indian economy. Um, I saw that C. Ram Manohar Reddy in the Hindu on September the 13th um, showed with NSS statistics that the gap was widened in the 1990s. That is that the average condition we can talk about averages um, of income, land holding, employment and unemployment, and education. The average condition of Muslims is, vis-a-vis um, Hindus, is uh, the gap is getting worse. <coughs> and while there are some commentators who feel that Muslims are at peace, the statistics show that they are negatively, not positively, discriminated against in the economy. There is some literature which looks at Muslim backwardness. What I feel about this literature is that it actually encourages the idea of religion as a basis for economic competition. We can say at any rate with some confidence that although there are members of uh, Muslims in the top 100 companies, and they are not represented in the vanguard of accumulation um, in India. And of course, there are no reservations for Muslims in the state. Now, I tried to find some pattern in the way Muslims are niched in the Indian economy. And uh, I will make some gross, gross generalizations. Um, whereas in the North, the history of uh, Muslims is generally seen in terms of invasion, in the South and on the coastal areas, it's seen much more in terms of trade and intermixing into marriage. Muslims in North India are, are to be found as peasants. They also are to be found in a great range of crafts, of still, skilled crafts, which relate back to the era of courtly patronage. Muslims are also found all over India in occupations which are shunned by Hindus. And uh, they are also to be found in trade, in a variety of trades. Um, with a division of occupation which is specific to different regions of India. Now, as we know, competition between Muslims and Hindus erupts into violence. I say competition advisedly. I feel that before religious difference or religion is invoked as a cause for communal violence, we must look at the groups as political and economic interest groups. And I think in many cases, riots and communal violence occurs under very specific economic conditions, which I've tried to write up, generalize about in my paper. <coughs> I think it happens when Muslims uh, begin to accumulate, when they begin to threaten occupations which have previously been held by Hindus, 
when the state reinforces um, unequal trust between the religions. But I'd be very glad to discuss afterwards the conditions on whether you think as an audience that there are economic reasons for communal violence between Hindus and Muslims. About Christians, who make up 2.3% of India's population, about 20 million, Christians are also um, highly differentiated, or might almost say polarized, between the ancient communities of Syrian Christians, um, which have made good uh, in finance capital, merchants capital, <coughs> industrial capital, and plantations. Um, and the Roman Catholic Church, which itself is a very big employer, between them on, one, on the one hand and uh, Dalit converts on the other, the majority of whom are poor and also deprived of any privilege of reservation. But now my question to you is the extent to which violence against Christians is also about um, <coughs> aspirations in the economy, because I can find really no literature, no research which unpacks that particular question. I'd be very glad uh, to know of it. Let me turn to within the Hindu family, to Sikhs, who make up 1.9% of the population. The thing I want to extract from my paper about Sikhs is that in Punjab, production and exchange and the industrial economy are all tremendously compartmentalized by religion and by caste. There is Sikh business in Punjab, but the business economy there is dominated by Hindus. And religion is being used, possibly, to carve out separate moral spaces for accumulation in agriculture, in trade, and in industry. Sikh merchant capital and industrial capital flourishes in the Sikh diaspora. My last observation concerns James. James are a minute proportion of the, economy, of the population, 0.4%. However, there is enormously high economic significance through their diaspora, because trade and business is one air occupation where James can practice non-violence. In my research, when I come across James, they are relatively wealthy money and corn brokers, and they are divided into a number of sets. Scholars have asked, is Jain business distinctive? The ethnographic evidence is quite inconclusive on this point. On the one hand, Jain's labor work on Jain businessmen says yes, they are distinctive. They're organized separately. They claim a cultural distinctiveness um, around corporate religious property. They claim that they have multiple bonds within the religion through kin, through residence and through their economic activity, particularly the way credit circulates and their control over their women. By contrast, Ellis, looking at um, James and other Vaishnavite Hindu businessmen in Rajasthan, said, no, they're not distinctive. <coughs> he writes that James defined their uniqueness through the spatial arrangements of the site of trade and business, through their accounting procedures, and through the importance they attach to public service. But then there's found no distinction with respect to these arrangements between Jains and between their Vaishnavite counterparts. So, at present, the evidence is inconclusive, and perhaps in one part of India they are very distinctive, while in another part of India they are not so distinctive. Because one thing that I've learned from my reading is that it is virtually impossible to make any kind of generalization about India. So if the evidence is inconclusive, what are there's no literature on what in my concluding remarks, I want to ask three questions and to make some extremely tentative answers to these questions. The first question is, why have religions not dissolved? And why have they not been banished to private life? For Marx and for Mirzar, religions acted as an opiate. Mirdal calls religions the emotional containers of poverty. It follows that if poverty is not um, uh, vanquished, 
and poverty continues, so the emotional containers will continue, religions will continue. I think this is a very facile and inadequate kind of explanation. I, I think another reason is state encouragement through this distinctive concept of secularism. I mean, the state is unequally engaged with the religions, and as a result, religions form political identities. There is very little to stop religious com political communities from be being competitive, especially where economic resources and rent are concerned. And that competition will vary from more or less equal respect to the brutest of force and domination. And while policy is framed in a language which is completely neutral to religion, its implementation is never neutral to religious groups. Then I think that religions may supply the collect some of the collective preconditions which are necessary for competition in markets. In other words, they perform some of the roles that markets need. Religions as social groups can be found to organize and protect rents, to organize credit and finance, to ration entry into occupational groups, to mute and to reduce competition, um, which is called defending your market share in corporate language, as a unit of information and contact, and as a unit for political representation, and to supply norms of conduct and of fairness. All of these things are necessary before the firms compete in markets. Now by saying this, I am not saying that the preconditions for market competition Other than religion, I'm saying that they may be defined in this way. Then religion supply authority in market exchange. As I said before, personal and family law seems to impose divine authority on property and on firms and on their organization. So the authority which is informing economic behavior is itself non-economic. It's a form of power which is not economic, but it affects in the economy. As a result, I think that as social scientists, scientists, we need to look at the conventional distinction between the public sphere and the private sphere. It seems that, in fact, they are much more meshed than this distinction would allow. Religious authority also governs the gender divisions of work and the gender divisions in social reproductive activity at home. The subordination of women is culturally justified by religion, and the piety of women in the domestic sphere often conditions business reputation. In other words, it's as basic to markets as information on prices and supply and demand. Reputation is essential for credit, for contracts, for investment. Female education, on the value of which the religions differ, also affects the accumulation of wealth through the capacity of women to socialize their children to it. And lastly, and perhaps trivially, the religions structure the consumption of goods and services, especially food. And in my field work, I found that festivals are as important to the pulse of the economy of a small town as agricultural seasons are. Religions also supply security. They compensate religions as social organizations, I have to reiterate this all the way through, they compensate in practical ways for the costs of economic engagement. Markets are something of a lottery, and not all participants in markets are winners. Some religious groups operate collective insurance. Some groups favor co-religionists co in the recruitment of labor. Some religious groups privilege co-religionists in the provision of 
livelihood and compensation for life's disasters. When accountability is defined in this way, then why do distributive obligations, to, for instance, through the state's convection system of tax and redistribution, can be avoided? The role of, the, of religion in transformation is the last reply I would give to this first question, why religions have its role in persisting the economy. I think the existence of religions slow down transformation. It divides the working class, and it, in doing so, it protects rates of accumulation. So although there's very little, little literature, I think that one can tentatively put forward a number of ideas as to why religions persist and influence the economy. Now, the second question is an economist question. How far is the role of religious plurality in the contemporary Indian economy conducive to efficiency? Well, religious minorities, at any rate, have been theorized as being groups, and I put this in inverted commas. Social institutions which owe their origins to religious authority may persist because they routinize activity. In the idiom of new institutional economics, they reduce transactions costs, they endow their members with implicit collateral for credit. The existence entirely novel amalgam resulting from the evolution of markets. Now, in this thought experiment, if a state fails to impose a consistent regulative order if a state doesn't require markets to provide the revenue resources for generalized security against risk, against accident, against poverty, if the legitimacy of its unequal and inconsistent practice is not respected, in other words, if a modern state cannot regulate the larger part of the economy which exists within its territory, then under this thought experiment, it would form two other ethical bases for regulation. Now, the religions of India may have a large, lowest common denominator in the marketplace, but the ethical consensus will depend on the numerical and economic strength of the religions in question. Hindutva might be read, although it generally has not been read, as an attempt not only to create and defend as large a space as possible for Hindu accumulation, but also to impose a more uniform ethical space on a tessellated economy, and to impose it over the, what we are called the wild dung growth of Hinduism itself. The problem is that this is at the expense of commodities and services and labor of the minorities especially the minorities with religious centers of gravity outside India. This might help to explain the political urgency of the religiosity which is known as Hindu fundamentalism and which the BJP has called true secularism. From my reading of the literature, there is therefore a case that religion is necessary to the informal economy of India. Of course, in certain regions, in certain sectors, in certain classes, the divisions are eroding. I'm not arguing that they're not. The alignment of the economy by occupation is blurred. The labor force is increasingly cosmopolitan. And increasingly, contracts between laborers and bosses no longer have non-contractual obligations. There is increasing differentiation within the religious groups. New commodities new opportunities exist for new entrants into the market. And in the rural areas, which this lecture has been conspicuously not about, land is increasingly available for sale and for purchase, and for sale and for purchase by people who were once forbidden to buy and sell land. So I'm going to stop with a very difficult conclusion. Difficult and tentative that the contemporary roles in the Indian economy of the religious minorities 
are consistent with two opposite forces. One of the forces of modernity, of dissolution, of the structuring roles of played by the religion. The other is the opposite. The nourishing of difference aligned along lines of religion. And I believe that liberalization is not actually increasing the power of the dissolving role of, of the modern economy, but instead increasing the tension between these two opposing forces. Now, Angel, a fool's washing where, where Angel fears the trail. And I would greatly appreciate your comments um, on how or why this may be right or wrong. Thank you very much. And like the 
they have made tremendous contribution in creation of wealth in this country. And they are their minority. They continue to be minority and they are not persecuted. My name is uh, Aril Das. I am a student of history. Yes. On page 
sale on sale 2021. Secularism, the estate and capital. <coughs> You have written, Madam, according to many observers in the early years of independence, the Indian state did not have sufficient priority to control communal tendencies of interest. Let alone enforce the schism party because of what it reveals is that, and again in your whole work, we find in some space that uh, you attach importance to the Indian state to give business would actually become a regulated base of the economy so that religion would no longer control the role of organizing um, either political or economic competition. But I try to explain in my lecture that there are ways in which the legal framework for the regulation of the economy was set up, most notably through the relegation of this concept of the private sphere, where it was personal, family, customary law, which is the divine, which is the embodiment of divine authority, and uh, imperfectly implemented rational universalistic regulatory law for the market. This meant that the private sphere was regulated in a way which supplied religious authority to the basic building blocks of the Indian economy, which are not, is not corporate capital, but the joint family firm, the family businesses. So it's in, in these ways that the Indian state did not project an antipathy to religion or a form of secularism as, for instance, the Soviet Union did, where religions were actively suppressed and where people who professed religion were persecuted. That wasn't India's way at all. But I'm saying that as a result of India choosing the form of secularism that it did, it left politics and the economy as territories where religions could and did compete. or making a remark or coming to any conclusion of religions, how they react on economy, etc. Because the sample design is not meant for number one. Number two uh, is uh, quantitative analysis should be there and if you have come across some data and if your decisions are based on them, we would be more enlightened if that should be given at this thing. Thank you. One uh, analyzed in a different way for a different purpose. This is a problem with big data sets, and you're perfectly correct. Um, there are more data sets that exist. Um, we look forward with interest to the results of the 2001 census. There is an NCAER survey of 35,000 households um, which supplies some data which Dr. Abdul Salih Shabi has begun to analyze. But this, it really hasn't been analyzed in depth. And as you may know, um, there, there are these articles earlier this month in the Hindu by Raman Mohammadi looking at the NSS sort of data and looking at the position of Muslims and Hindus. And he makes the point also that the data can be analyzed in much greater depth. For instance, as the first speaker <coughs> rightly suggested, it could be analyzed by regions and by states. But we wait for this to be done. And in the absence of good statistics, um, it's the absence of good statistics makes fertile territory for wild speculation. So I agree with you that the more statistical analysis there is, I agree 
in uh, many of your observations sorry. Uh, I feel that uh, based on the literature that we have come across in psychology, especially in cross-sectoral psychology, it uh, very clearly talks about the relationship between religiosity and devotion. And there are very clear data suggesting that in societies where decisions are taken by uh, religious, religious consideration, or in other words, decisions are dominated by religious consideration, those societies are backward. So there is an inverse relationship between religiosity and development, which has been established in cross cultural psychology research already. So the text of that uh, sounds very similar to what we have been talking about. The other thing is, where I, I, I disagree with your observation, that in the 90s, the, the religions have uh, suddenly started acquiring a special stage in Indian society. People have become, people are gradually becoming more religious, which could be detrimental to economical development. Let me tell you, uh, of course, I don't have data again. Uh, like, uh, like you also don't have data from anything that you have been saying. But uh, then observations are there, and uh, it's my opinion, and it is a uh, very nice audience here to comment on this, that the religiosity in fact has not increased in the 90s. It has in fact decreased with increase in uh, rate of uh, literacy and education and scientific temperament in the country. But unfortunately, the politics in this country has acquired religious overtones, or maybe the religious, uh, religion has acquired political overtones. Uh, uh, that's because, it's because of that, that uh, maybe outsiders or those who view this society from a distance feel that we are becoming more and more religious. I'm afraid uh, this doesn't seem to be a fact to me. Yes. Now, 
are much more religious than they appear to be one generation ago. So it's a, a specific instance of a study of um, the least of big family businesses over one generation. And it illustrates the problem of data and also the terrible problem of temptation to generalize and inference that one um, is prey to. So if I made it sound as a penalty in generalization, then I stand guilty. Um, on good chart, um, you have um, knit, you have beaten me because I wanted to ask this audience for their own views. I, d I don't know, I haven't found in the um, accounts of the problem in Gujarat an economic explanation for it. And I would be very glad to know whether anybody has analyzed how it was that it took a cross caste cross caste form. Um, and yet, there, might, um, there may be a complex economic explanation related to the different contributors to that killing. Um, but if those I haven't read it, and if anybody in the audience knows it, I'd be very glad to be told of it. Um, the last point that you made will really reinforce this idea that I try to make, is it, that the way in which religion operates in the economy may be indirect and complicated. Because in your own argument itself, you were saying that the leaders of um, the high uh, science of the economy and uh, right-wing elements and neoliberal presumably policy advisors and theoreticians concur and that their ideology concretizes into something which is capable of fomenting communal violence. And my point is whether it's a question whether there is a class basis to this ideology when we see communal rights. So it's simply a question to the audience. Okay. Uh, 
for inquiry. Also, how those minorities, which have generally been reduced in a, an essentialist way to groups based on different concepts of secularity. Um, and I don't know research that, for instance, looks at um, Hindu Muslim relations given the concept of secularity that pertains in Britain with Hindu Muslim relations given the concept of secularism which exists in India. It's not very, it's not, not to my knowledge, but it may be, it's outside my field. Um, the next question was, did I agree with the quote of the, um, of the Parsi Police Commissioner? Whether I agree with it is neither here nor there. I'm simply quoting it as an example of an attempt to explain communal violence not simply in religious terms, but in terms of economic competition. The third question asked me to reconcile my conclusion that, or my apparent conclusion, that the economy requires a plurality of religion with my remarks about the state. What I'm concluding, and I, I need to make this as crystal clear as I can, is that the Indian economy requires a plurality of religions because there is considerable continuity in the informal, non-state regulated economy which maps occupations into all kinds of social groups, caste, sect, denominations, theology. I'm not saying that occupations are not mapped also in other ways, but that there is a striking continuity in India, which reaches right through to the present. At the same time, there is an increasing cosmopolitanism, and as one questioner um, mentioned, there is, in a sense, there is a way in which liberalization and modernity is dissolving the bonds of religion in the economy not necessarily in other areas of our experience. So, contradictory processes in my view are set in motion in the Indian economy in relation to the role of religions. Um, now, the conditions of production in India require religious plurality because the economy has been tessellated or has become cellular. This is a historical observation, it's a conclusion that may be contested, but there's abundant evidence, and I'm not the only person to make this conclusion. When occupation is aligned by religion, then clearly um, the material conditions of production will allow and maybe enable these communities to persist and thrive and will support the plurality of religions. That's the point that I'm making. Uh, I have a suggestion, not for the facts which you have presented regarding the link between economy and religion, but uh, the way the entire project is conceptualized. Like I think that uh, instead of uh, saying India's uh, religious plurality, the term cultural plurality will uh, will be more preferable uh, simply because it has global implications. And uh, like cultural pl plurality is prevalent all over the world. And I wonder in which country can anybody say that minorities' contribution to GDP has been uh, uh, calculated? I'm not aware of any, any country which can say this. Huh? No, no, but that, that uh, but not for the Asian community, which are there in the... Asian community. Anyway, my, uh, uh, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main question is that cultural plurality is more preferable to religious plurality. Uh, also because re religion is a very loaded term and uh, once you define, uh, define your concepts in terms of India's uh, plural religion, it also implies it. It makes a specific case of India that you are looking 
uh, on, on India in a way different than the global uh, uh, differentiation in terms of culture. Yeah, that's all. Implicit in the argument that you made from this lecture that have India not been invested with the plurality of religions, had it had one monolithic, totally dominant religion, its economy would have taken a different course? If yes, then in what way? And one supplementary question to this is uh, some kind of a parallel with Pakistan. Now, uh, people of India and Pakistan are drawn from similar ethnic extractions. One is a, a secular country with a multiplicity of religion, other one subscribes to one state uh, sponsored religion, state supported religion, which is Islam. In what way have the economies of India and Pakistan taken into the process? Thank you. Religion is a loaded term. It seems to me that some people have it seems that I am making an exception of India. Um, I need to use culture for religion. It would, dif it would be difficult for me to tease out the other elements of the social regulation of the economy, which I have tried to research and to write about. Look at how it's regulated by gender, by caste, by class. In a sense, you could apply the same argument. You could say, why look at gender, look at culture? Why look at class, look at culture? A lot of the forms of power and authority then get bundled together in a way that is just as confusing as the way neoclassical economists disregard the social regulation of the economy altogether. So I plead to want to look at the role of religions um, I came to ask the questions about the role of religions through finding that caste in South India, where I do field work, has evolved to form um, very important regulative roles through trade associations, which were quite secular, but which have in fact grown out of caste associations and have a corporatist kind of take corporate form. Um, I was moved then to to ask the question if this is the way caste works um, in terms of its regulative capacity. Um, how do religions work? And I think that religions are not scaled up caste at the level of detail um, when we looked at when we look at sect and denomination and subcaste or uh, occupation. We may feel that the way religions work in the economy is similar to the way caste works in the economy. But at the macro level of the um, Indian nation, the way the religions are treated by the state is very different from the way caste is treated by the state. So there's a difference. So I would want to distinguish caste from religion. Um, and in, in the same way, I would want to distinguish the other ways I've tried to look at the social regulation of the informal economy and distinguish them from culture, which might be a big, big umbrella concept under which the various forms of power exist. And I hope you don't think that I'm arguing for um, ex the exceptionalism of ex exceptionalism in India. Um, I take the view that um, every national economy has its own character. It's stop in trade for financial journeys. Every market has its own character. Sometimes it's the character of a market is formed by individuals. Um, but I, I also feel that it's a legitimate question for economists to examine national character, the character of an economy. What makes the Indian economy Indian other than territory? I feel it's a legitimate question. To that extent, you could put the construction of what I'm trying to do, that I'm arguing for an exceptionalism, but then I'm arguing for the exceptionalism of every country project. Now you asked about Pakistan and I don't know enough about social regulation of Pakistan's informal economy to know how to reply to you. But you asked if India had had one religion, would its economy have taken a different form? And the corollary of my argument is that it probably would have taken a different form. But what form? I don't know. 
Because I'm not dealing with counterfactuals. I'm trying to explain why the Indian economy takes the form that it does, why it has a particular character. What is its character? How can we analyze the kinds of power that give the Indian economy its character? And that's my question. Respected Professor Hannes Wright. Members of the Ivory Foundation and distinguished guests. This organization has invited me several times to participate in this program and I've had to decline. I've not declined out of any lack of interest in the work that Adri is doing, far from it. I decline these invitations out of respect for the serious academic studies that groups like Adri are trying to encourage. I say out of respect because I humbly admit that no one who is serving in a position of public responsibility, the as the Chief Justice of a High Court, has the time to apply his mind to the kind of detailed academic analysis of problems that should be standard in meetings such as this. While I was on my way back from a judicial meeting early this month, Though I happened to meet Dr. Gupta on the plane, somewhat embarrassed by my past reluctance to accept invitations, I agreed to preside over this meeting, perhaps to his plea. At the time, I had hoped to be able to go through the paper to be presented here today by Professor Harris White and prepare a detailed discussion on this important subject. I am afraid I was being optimistic. I recall that Queen Elizabeth once described the year gone by by an Anna's horrible list as it was a year that had been full of tension and one crisis after another. I might say that the past month has been something of a month of horrible list for me as on top of normal overload. I apologize to the learned speaker and to the members of the that my remarks may not be as formal nor as academically researched as I would have wished. Significantly singular but insignificantly noticed is the subject of pluralism of religions and the manner in which it affects the economy of a nation in development. India is a developed nation with an emphasis on is. There is nothing that it does not have democratic institutions, though for local consumption, they are permitted to slip here and there. India produces, India manufactures for home consumption and for export. But here the list must cease. We seem to be very sensitive about being called a developing country. We are developed undoubtedly, but after having executed Marshall's development plans from 1950, first a set of five-year plans, then seven-year plans. I am not taking stock of the result of the plans. In the six days, we seem to be feeling elated with catchphrases coming from economist W. W. Rasto of a self-generating economy about our economic plans of good encouraging statements during the six days by other economists like Barbara Ward and John Kenneth Galbraith spoke of a stable economic structure planned for takeoff. We faded the Damodar Valley project the Bhakra Nandu, the Trombay Atomic Energy Station, the Bilai Steel Plant, the Durga Steel Plant, and the Rolkera Steel Mill. The publication division of the government of India instead insisted on showing the false documentary in every cinema hall before the picture showing that everything was fine and fit and progressive and the plans are on schedule as if George Orwell himself was in charge. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm leading to a point. Today, economists of those who survive and made those plans, if there are any left, acknowledge that the plans were ideal. Those who envisioned them were idealists. Those who made them had the missionary zeal and the desire to see the results of these plans. But then, who were those people who made the plans? We seem to forget this aspect when we make a critical analysis of India's economy and the development of the economy. 
The makers of these plans were good people, whether in politics or as economists. I'll not take their names, but they belong to an era and they were people with an integrity of purpose. They came out of a mold known as Fabian Socialism. Without naming the Indian giants in the mold, these were people tempered by G. Wells, Bernard Shaw, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, R. Pamdar, etc. The plans did not fail. No sooner was this generation out than two things happened. The integrity of purpose to execute, execute the plans went with them. Second, the vision failed. The Constitution of India mentions socialism. There was nothing wrong with socialism. The people who ran it subsequently may have grounded it. The danger which I see is of a constitutional mandate, which socialism is, becoming nothing but a platform. Three decades ago, the economic order in the world was changing. India was inserting in the preamble to its constitution new words, sovereign democratic republic, to read, we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. The word socialist is still there. Many in the intelligentsia seem to forget that the word socialist is very much a part of the constitution and they seem to have forgotten that. As the economic order in the Europe was affecting the political entities, as John Gunther called these the sixes and the sevens outside the European community and the Soviet bloc, India was unaffected by the economic collapse that was going to happen within these nations. All of a sudden, the world saw behind the curtain the poverty, the unemployment, the inflation, the deficit financing, the collapse of the banking and degradation of the environment of life, with drug peddlers and prostitution on the streets, and massive migration to West Europe and the Americas. Now comes the paradox. The funders were being funded with the capital of another economic system. India was unaffected by these changes in these nations. Not only this, the economic miracle in the South Korea also saw a collapse. That was an economy planned by bankers. The debt was too much. The nations which brought the bankers could not keep away the creditors, but the debt could not be recycled. That almost took a toll of South Korea. India was not affected by such situations. Somehow India has been moving on. However, slowly. But today's paper, presented by Professor Harris White, brings another picture. The paper does not criticize the plans for development and the result of the plans. She points out a very ugly fact that something that had never been imagined bogs down the economic development in the private sector. A luxury liner will give you the luxury cruise, but it won't go anywhere if the sailor will not lift the anchor. It is the anchor which we are considering in discussing this paper. Our religion, yours, mine, others, affects planning, the economy and development. Religion has played a part, Dr. Harris White said, 